From KGW News, this is Straight Talk with Laurel Porter. Hello and welcome to Stray Talk. I'm Laurel Porter. One of the most influential leaders in Oregon politics is retiring. We're talking about 4th District Congressman Peter DeFazio, the current chair of the powerful House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. DeFazio has served 36 years in the U.S. House, representing Lane County and much of southwestern Oregon. He is the longest serving member in Oregon history and the 65th longest in U.S. history. The commute home to Springfield, Oregon from D.C. to campaign every two years has been tough. He says it's the longest commute for a congressional member in the lower 48. In announcing his retirement, Congressman DeFazio said it's time to pass the baton on to the next generation so he can focus on his health and well-being. DeFazio's term will end in January of next year. Here to reflect on his accomplishments, the state of Congress today, its future, and what's next for him, I'm pleased to welcome back to Straight Talk, Oregon 4th District Congressman Peter DeFazio. Congressman, so nice to have you back on the show. Thanks, Laurel. It's always, it's always fun. Thank you. Well, you announced, well, it's great to have you, and you announced your retirement last month, so how are you feeling about it now? Do you have any second thoughts about leaving Congress? None whatsoever. You said uh, you that. Know, 36 no, oh, 36 years is uh, a very, very long time. I mean, I don't, I don't live in Portland, so I've got to connect somewhere. It takes me a minimum of 20 hours round trip. Uh, it wears on you. Uh, you know, that's 500 hours a year or so commuting to D.C. And, uh, you know, I got my last major uh, objective that had escaped me since the Obama administration uh, done this year. Not exactly in the form I wanted. Uh, but we got it done, which is a huge increase in funding for America's deteriorated infrastructure, roads, bridges, highways, transit, rail, ports, uh, water, wastewater, and uh, and broadband. Uh, and that, uh, you know, I drove that debate. We passed the bill out of the House twice uh, that had a bit more money in it and did a lot more for climate change. But uh, in the end, we had to take uh, a compromise from the Senate and, uh, you know, weren't uh, because uh, of their stupid filibuster rules. So uh, that was the last big thing out there, right? That's locked in for five years. Uh, got the Harbor Maintenance Tax uh, Trust Fund set up last year after 25 years. Um, you know, completed my investigation of Boeing and uh, totally reformed the way we certify aircraft so uh, people don't kill for profit anymore. And, uh, you know, most everything that uh, I've been looking to get done, I got done, and it just seemed like a good time. Well, you've been involved in those transportation issues throughout your congressional career. You really are an undisputed leader on the issue. And as you mentioned, you were instrumental in crafting and passing President Biden's bipartisan infrastructure bill. But as you, once you got it through the House, you did lose some key provisions and, it, and the Senate made it much smaller. Were you, were you disappointed in that? Did that frustration influence your decision to retire? Well, uh, I wasn't uh, I wasn't happy with uh, their product. I mean, like I say, um, the number's big, uh, and we need those investments. Uh, they stripped out some of my most meaningful policy to deal with climate change and transform us uh, to a 21st century transportation system. But now uh, the administration is going to attempt to uh, plug those things back in uh, as they uh, as they give grants and distribute the funds. Uh, critical. Uh, a component I had was called fix, you know, fix it first. First, uh, reinvest in fixing our, you know, 42,000 bridges that need repair or replacement, uh, and uh, the hundred billion dollar backlog in transit. Uh, and then, secondly, look at alternatives before you build more highways. Uh, you know, I was inspired by Virginia. They have a huge problem. It was in the news very much just a week ago with the snowstorm on 95 south of D.C. Massive, massive congestion. The, uh, they were looking at building yet one more lane on that highway, uh, but they figured by the time they finished in 10 years, it would be as congested as it is today. It's called induced demand. Uh, so instead, uh, they came up with a novel idea, uh, a, a higher speed rail project from Richmond to DC, negotiated with CSX Railroad, and they figured they're gonna get a heck of a lot of cars off the road and people aren't gonna get stuck on the highway in a giant snowstorm in the future. I wanted other states, and some states will do that, 
uh, by themselves, but I wanted to force all the states before they go out and do massive new highway building to look at those alternatives. Uh, and the administration is now trying to implement that uh, through rule or administrative guidance. So I, I'm gonna be working very closely with them on how this money gets spent and try and get back to some of the things I had in my version of the bill. Well, those midterm elections are quickly approaching and analysts believe there's a very real chance your party could lose control of Congress. What do you think Democrats have to do to retain control? Uh, we need to get uh, a version of Build Back Better over the finish line and to the president's desk. Uh, you know, we uh, we passed uh, a version in the House that uh, I contributed to significantly more money for high speed rail, uh, a novel transit program uh, to, uh, you know, to help access more affordable housing through transit deserts and underserved areas uh, and, uh, you know, more money for wastewater, drinking water. Uh, but uh, right now it's stranded on the Senate side. Uh, you know, the negotiations have been temporarily sort of put on the back burner while they try and get voting rights done. But uh, I think that that's going to be critical. Uh, the infrastructure was big. There'll be a lot of jobs. Uh, and, uh, you know, that will uh, that will help the economy and help people. Uh, but, uh, you know, Build Back Better is uh, very ambitious in terms of some of the proposals there, which would touch every American. Let me ask you, Congressman, two other top Democrats and chairman of committees have announced their plans to retire. And that, along with your announced retirement, prompted the National Republican Congressional Committee to say that committee chairs don't retire unless they know their majority is gone. True. Do you think that's going to happen? You're going you would be in the minority if you stayed. I think the Republicans are measuring the drapes way too early, and I love their overconfidence. I got to tell you, they're not going to get my district. Uh, you know, I've uh, I've endorsed a candidate, experienced campaigner, experienced legislator, uh, and uh, Val Hoyle, our labor commissioner, and uh, she's going to keep the district. It's it's better than the district I ran in, which was officially a Republican district. That's because uh, of redistricting, still, right? That that yep. made it more Democratic. Was that fair to the Republicans that you represent to redistrict it so that now it's more in favor of the Democrats? Um. It was uh, done, I believe, in a very fair way. I, the lines uh, make sense. I had to shed a lot of people uh, because uh, we got a sixth congressional seat. Uh, you know, they have uh, right now we're going to have uh, one uh, deep red seat, uh, two deep blue seats, Bonamici and Blumenauer, and three uh, seats that are competitive. So I, I think it's a, a very fair map. As you look at Congress and you look at the Democratic Party, are you happy with where the Democratic Party is? And as you look at retiring, what advice would you give your party? Well, um, I've always focused on what we call kitchen table issues, particularly from the perspective of my committee. Uh, also from my position on uh, opposing all the free trade agreements, which exported uh, millions of uh, high quality jobs out of the United States of America to China, made us dependent upon China. Uh, and we found out what a folly that was uh, during this pandemic. Uh, so that's that's been a major focus for me. And and I hope that, uh, uh, you know, with with the infrastructure bill and build back better, we can make the case that we are focused on kitchen table issues and uh, not on bizarre uh, you know, conspiracy theories or obstruction or all the things the Republicans have become about. The Congressman, we dug into the KGW vault and found some footage of you from 1988, your first term in Congress. In this brief clip that will show your opposing aid to the Contra rebels in Nicaragua during the Reagan years, and that's followed by a clip from 2002 when you're talking about the fall of Enron. Let's listen. My position is not a penny, not ever. Uh, not an aspirin, nothing for the Contras. We stand shoulder to shoulder with all our constituents, small business, big business, consumer advocates, and people who have traditionally been industry advocates, and people who even work for PGE in Portland are saying to me, what can you do about this? What are you going to do about this? They've all been screwed. And here's some more video from those early years when you look back, Congressman, at your 36-year career in Congress. You've had a lot of accomplishments, but what are you most proud of? Well... Uh, it's not a legislative accomplishment, but uh, I've given uh, nearly uh, 300 scholarships uh, to uh, to workers uh, getting retrained at 
uh, people trying to get a leg up and go to community colleges in my district out of congressional pay raises. But but beyond that, I've got a, a tremendous number of legislative assist accomplishments, some which will live uh, long after I'm, I'm gone. Uh, for instance, uh, I got a change in the law in 2006. It was very technical, kind of wonky change. But Oregon went from what was called a, a donor state to a donee state. We have been getting less federal money back than we sent in. And uh, that has endured to today. It's brought an extra $1.3 billion into Oregon since 06 uh, for transportation. And uh, next year, it'll bring in about another uh, extra $100 million a year and into the future, and, and unless the formula gets changed in five years. So, um, you know, there, there are many, many things that, that I've worked on across a wide range of issues, but uh, those are kind of the top. And one of the laws that may last a long time that you championed and passed in 2020 reigns in health insurance price gouging. Tell us about that and how that will help Americans going forward. Well, when we went through the debate over the Affordable Care Act, I held town halls. One had 2,500 people in Douglas County, very unhappy about uh, what they called Obamacare. Uh, but I always I would start the meeting by talking about uh, the uh, health insurance industry and the price gouging, the redlining, all the things they were doing, and say we should take away the antitrust immunity of the health insurance industry. No other industry in America, the only other thing that gets an exemption from antitrust law is professional sports. And, uh, you know, I would get a huge cheer out of both the single payer people and the anti affordable care act people. It was in the house bill. It got stripped out in the uh, Senate version that passed, which was nowhere near as good as the house bill. And, uh, then I had a separate vote on the floor in the house. We got a uh, 400 and I think 12 people voted for it. Uh, but it never got enacted into law until this last a year ago, December. I finally negotiated it into the year end budget deal and the health insurance industry wasn't looking. Boy, were they upset afterwards. <laughs> and, and what does that mean to, to Oregonians that that got through? Uh, according to consumer reports, this is going to uh, bring about more competition and lower premiums. Uh, you know, you've had an industry where uh, they would divide up the country and they could do that. They'd say, look, uh, you know, don't go into Oregon. We want to dominate Oregon. Uh, you can keep Washington or you can keep Idaho. They would have big meetings among all the principal health insurance companies every year and, and divide up the market, decide what they were going to charge and who they were going to exclude and uh, pre-existing conditions, all those things. Uh, they can't do that anymore. They, that, that's uh, a violation of antitrust law now. And I hope the Justice Department's going to prosecute them if they do. We have some photos from our archives of an expedition you took uh, to the South Pole in the year 2000. I know you must have all kinds of memories that stand out, Congressman. Can you share one or two of those memories that you might have of your career? Well, the, the South Pole was extraordinary. I went with the uh, Commandant of the Coast Guard. Uh, they they uh, maintain uh, the harbor into uh, McMurdo, our main base there. Uh, and uh, that was just uh, an extraordinary trip. I actually got to uh, uh, drive the icebreaker for a little bit uh, until I got a little bit uh, too far off course and into some thick ice and the, uh, the captain took over again. Uh, so that, that, was, uh, that was amazing. And it's not something that uh, many people get to do. And I felt very privileged to have got to do that. You've also lost some battles along the way, of course, in 36 years that you're proud you fought. Uh, tell us about a couple mm -hmm. of battles you lost, but you're glad you, you fought them. Uh, the bailout of Wall Street. Uh, we beat them. We beat them for one day in the House of Representatives. People were shocked. I said, let Wall Street pay for its own bailout. Reinstitute the transaction tax on uh, on uh, exchanges on Wall Street, which we had from 1918 till 1967. We built the greatest economy on earth when we had that tax. It doesn't hurt capital formation. And in the House, uh, we defeated their bailout. And if, the, if we had held that, we'd have a better country today. They're right back to doing what they did before. 40% uh, of our economy is financial transactions dominated by Wall Street, high speed traders. They had no value. Uh, they employ few people and they destroy good companies. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, they, they tanked the stock market. The Senate came back to town. Uh, they, uh, they voted to bail out Wall Street. They brought it back to the House. And uh, uh, unfortunately, a number of my colleagues were weak need. They changed their vote and they got their bailout. Uh, the others would be fighting free trade. 
uh, as I mentioned earlier, what a folly to become export millions of good jobs to China, which has caused massive problems in the United States of America, uh, and also become totally dependent upon them for critical things like N95 masks or chips when you manufacture cars and hundreds and hundreds of other things. Well, Congressman, we'll continue our conversation with Congressman DeFazio and hear his advice for whoever succeeds him in the 4th District and talk about changes in Congress. We're back in two minutes. Welcome back to Straight Talk. I'm Laurel Porter. We're talking with Oregon 4th District Congressman Peter DeFazio. At this time next year, DeFazio may be on the beach or may be exploring more of the Oregon he loves. But one thing's likely for sure, he won't be in D.C. He's retiring at the end of this year. Congressman, thank you again for joining us here on Straight Talk. And I uh, hear no, thanks, that you're thinking about writing a book in your retirement. What will it be about? And do you have a title yet? Well, I don't want to reveal the title. Someone might. Uh, it's a great title. But um, starting about uh, 10 years ago, I, I uh, gave a speech. Uh, I, I was invited by a friend who was teaching actually over at Merton College in Cambridge and also taught the U of O. And I gave my first version of a speech, America's Representative Democracy, Can It Survive? Uh, and they were shocked uh, what they learned about the, the threats to uh, democracy, the Democratic Republic in the United States of America. And I'm going to say things uh, have gotten worse since then. Uh, but I want to talk about the root causes of, you know, what we can do about it uh, uh, for the future. So I've been throwing things in a folder for a couple of decades, never had time to organize them. Uh, but uh, retirement may give me that opportunity. Well, what do you think now, uh, since you gave that speech, can American democracy survive? Uh, we need critically, I think we mentioned earlier, the Voting Rights Act. Uh, you know, we are seeing a systemic uh, changes being made in states like Georgia, where the legislature now has the authority to overrule the uh, the popular vote, the vote of the people, uh, you know, and uh, and other things to exclude people from voting, particularly people of color uh, in in numerous states, uh, Arizona, elsewhere around the country where the Republicans totally control things. And, uh, you know, what happened on uh, the 6th of uh, January was essentially uh, the end stage of an attempted desperate uh, coup uh, by Trump and his uh, his hench people. Uh, and uh, had they got a hold of one of those ballot boxes, he said on September 23rd, Pittsburgh, you know, if they don't count the Electoral College votes, I'll be president again because every state gets one vote and we win. Yeah, that's right. Alaska gets one vote. California gets one vote. And he would have won. That's what they were trying to do. Uh, so we came to the precipice uh, and we've got to uh, restore the right of the people to vote and to have free and fair elections and do away with this mythology that somehow he was cheated, <laughs> lost by seven million votes. But it, that was all fake news and he was cheated. Well, we're taping this Thursday afternoon and you and other members of the House voted this morning on voting rights legislation along party lines. And that sets up a battle in the Senate where it could get blocked. Republicans say Democrats have overblown the need for this legislation. What do you think happens next in the Senate? Is there a chance it could get passed? You know, it's odd, uh, you know, when the Supreme Court first, uh, uh, you know, obliterated parts of the Voting Rights Act, uh, the Senate, in a very bipartisan way, proposed to restore it. Uh, and, but now, just a few years later, uh, it's become a partisan issue. Uh, and I think it's, it's, a, it's very, very dangerous for the country. Uh, I think that uh, there are some Republicans, there are negoti no negotiations going on with some Republicans who feel that there should be at least some minimal federal backstop. We should at least reform the Electoral College Act of 1877, uh, which uh, Bannon and Trump's hench people tried to exploit to uh, keep him in the presidency, uh, that would be key also. A lot of Democrats are eyeing your district. They're considering a run. You've said that you have endorsed Labor Secretary Val Hoyle, who's from near your hometown in, in Springfield. And there are a lot of other Democrats looking at the race. On the Republican side, Alex Scarlatos, who was your opponent in 2020, has said he'll run again. What words of advice do you have for whoever succeeds you in the 4th District? Well, uh, you know, represent your people well. I have very, very strong uh, constituent services. 
uh, day in, day out. Uh, many people contact my office, problems with the Veterans Administration, Social Security, small business, Forest Service, whatever. Uh, and that is the only contact many people are going to ever have. Uh, they don't watch the national legislation that much. That's key uh, to representing people. Uh, but then, uh, you know, I'm supporting someone who has a proven legislative track record, majority leader of the Oregon State House, very accomplished legislator. Uh, you have to be a legislator, too. You've got to be able to do both things or all things at the same time. And it's going to be a tough fight. Uh, she represented a, a state rep district that was a mirror of my district. It was, I would say, purple, uh, conservative. And, uh, you know, my district now is like a very light tinge of blue. It is not a slam dunk for anybody. And we need someone who can win that fight. And uh, then hopefully uh, she'll take my advice. Uh, Mr. Scarlatos would be a disaster. When he declared, he said, I'm not the most qualified candidate. I would delete the word most. Well, that was a really tough battle in 2020, most expensive race in Oregon history, congressional race. So you think it's going to be another tough one? Oh, yeah. Uh, they uh, targeted me from uh, day one. Uh, they've targeted the seat uh, even uh, you know, since uh, I've retired and probably even more. They're looking at, uh, they've got so much money, all the, the black money they've got, all these super PACs and everything else because of the Supreme Court. Uh, they're looking at uh, trying to be competitive in seats that are rated as D plus 10 or 12. Uh, and the 4th Congressional District is way below that threshold. No, they will be putting a lot of money into this race. But I beat Mr. Scarlatos by six points, uh, and the district is better. Uh, so it's going to be a bad year for Democrats. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm confident that Val can win it. You know, you've lived on a boat on the waterfront in D.C. for 13 or 14 years. Are you going to miss that? Uh, well, what I'd like to do is actually get to take the boat out as opposed to just kind of living on it. It's the cheapest way to live in D.C. Uh, I'm on the waterfront. Uh, it used to be a very rundown and dangerous uh, neighborhood. It's now the trendiest neighborhood in D.C. due to redevelopment. Uh, and I'm living there for a tiny fraction of what someone pays for a condo fee in these expensive uh, buildings. So uh, I'd like to have an opportunity to take the boat out. I don't know if I'll get it this year. I might hang on to it for a bit and cruise it. I'd love to do the intercoastal waterway, uh, you know, up and down the East Coast or something. That, that could be part of my retirement, would be having a little bit of fun uh, out on the water. And I'm sure you're looking forward to spending more time with your family. And we, uh, we just have to show some of some of these beautiful yeah. photos of your sweet little rescue black lab, Liddy, uh, grown up a lot since the last time we saw you. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's the day we met her right there. Uh, she is, and that's her with me at a climate action rally. Uh, she's a climate action dog. Uh, and she is like the sweetest, cutest uh, little black lab uh, ever. And, uh, you know, we've, we've had a number of uh, adopted dogs. Uh, she's getting the title of the sweetest dog ever. And I understand you also want to do some hiking in some of the wilderness areas that you work to preserve. Yeah, I would love to go back to Devil's Staircase. That's uh, the hardest day hike I've ever done in my life. Uh, we actually got a little bit uh, disoriented. I won't say lost, uh, but there's <laughs> no, no real trail. And I was with... Uh, uh, two Forest Service people and uh, and Andy Stahl, and we still kind of got uh, in the wrong area because uh, it's it's true uh, untracked wilderness. And then copper salmon, uh, you know, love to get back to the Oregon caves, which uh, which I got expanded out to the Steens, uh, which was negotiated in my office, not wilderness, but uh, you know, but uh, the Steens of recreation area. There's there's a, a lot of legacy there. Run some of the rivers. Uh, I did the largest expansion with Mark Hatfield, uh, old fashioned Republican, good guy, uh, real legislator uh, and, a, and a wonderful human being. The largest expansion of wild and scenic rivers in the lower 48 uh, in either, it was either my second or third term. Uh, now that I've got my old newsletters, I'll be able to figure out when we did that. Well, Congressman, it has been a pleasure to have you here on Stray Talk. I hope we get the chance to talk with you again before you retire. And thank you for your many years of service to the state of Oregon. Oh, thanks, Laurel. Uh, I appreciate it. I appreciate uh, having had the privilege of serving Oregon and Oregon's 4th Congressional District for 36 years.
Thank you all. And thank you all for watching Straight Talk. We'll see you next week for Straight Talk. Have a great week.